Hello my friends and welcome to continued coverage of GP Toronto. The format is modern and we've got some big names in the feature match area for the pro show today. Ben Rubin and Chris Beckmesian here are going to get underway. Both of them off to the perfect 4-0 and o start. Ben Rubin, well, he's joined the dark side here, Eduardo, playing Hollow One. The dark side? <laughs> it's the very dark side, mate. It's the, uh, it's, I mean, look, it's just, he's all about spinning that wheel, all about rolling them bones. Chris Beckmesian, on the other hand, other hand, we have uh, Island into Ethervile. Can you, oh, a bit of a fishy start from him here, uh, Eduardo. We are by the lake here oh, yeah. in Toronto, so it's actually pretty fair. But yeah, um, Chris very clearly on Merfolk. Island into Ethervile. Big the telltale sign. Yeah, yeah, you can see it from a mile away, and uh, looks like Beckmesian is kicking it old school now with the fishers. Now, the big question I'm sure everyone will want answered straight away: Is he playing green? He is not. Wow, wow. no. I, but I actually believe that this is a correct choice, having tried um, both versions to some extent. Okay. Um, because the the problem with the green versions is your mana consistency is not as good because you're playing Formula Vault. And sometimes you're actually lacking double blue for your lords. Yeah, right. So it's important to uh, tr keep the get one of the strengths of Merfolk, it's very consistent. So by adding green, you're making the deck less consistent. And that's kind of the problem. You do add a 2-2 two, two for one, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, Merfolk cost. more or less does the same thing every time, right? Like it, it plays out some some 2-2s two that, that buff everyone else, because Milan Walk, whatever else. It plays out these random sort of disruptive creatures. Play, it can draw extra cards with uh, Civil Gala. But every game more or less looks the same. It's pretty, for, for a deck that, you know, doesn't... I mean, it is a very linear plan. Yes, indeed. Um, speaking of, well, let's say non-linear we motion. Here we go. Oh, look at this. We are having flashbacks to last week, ladies and gentlemen. Turn one or turn two burning inquiry here for Ben Rubin. And we are going to see how many hollow ones hit the battlefield here. Uh, here. Look at this. It is just like last week when we saw some of the best players in the world really getting it done. We had people in the top eight playing uh, hollow one. And uh, Burning Inquiry was the, the way to get it done here. Both players choosing to just uh, just pick the cards at random, more or less, rather than uh, using dice. That does seem pretty quick. Zero Hollow Ones discarded for Ben Rubin. How many in hand? I don't think I see also any. Also zero? Uh, oh, wow. He didn't get there. Didn't get there. Bit of a disapp <laughs> disappointing start for Ben Rubin. Although he is going to be able to bring a Blood Ghast back. Not going to have haste just yet, but still nice bit of value here for Rubin. He was hoping to discard. I mean, look at that. Two Flame Wake Phoenixes and a, uh, a Blood Ghast in hand. That's a bad burning inquiry for him. Yeah, but you you know what you signed up for. Oh, yeah. I have no sympathy here. <laughs> you have no zero sympathy. Zero. zero. If, you, if you sign up to play Burning Inquiry... In a magic tournament, you accept what happens. You can't win your bet, so you can't go out after. Like, oh, I didn't discard the cards no. I want to disc. No, 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 no. You just shut it down straight away. Right, exactly. Shut it down. Uh, what I really want to see with Burning Inquiry is is just completely messing up your opponent's opening. I want them to draw three lands and four spells and cast Burning Inquiry and have seven non-land permanents or the, seven non-land cards. Buffed in hand. him to Tarak. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, yeah. what I want. But yeah, just just to talk a little about how this matchup is going to play out, because right. it's not like one that we've really, I think, seen. No. Um, th this is all semi-speculative, um, because I haven't played this matchup in great detail, but um, I believe that because uh, Chris is playing in his list free Master of Waves, um, as well as free Vapor Snags, that he's going to be a little favored here. Okay. Uh, basically, Ben needs to put on a very fast clot. He has to be the aggressor before Chris can build up a large board. Once Chris builds up a large board, it's going to be hard for Ben to go through. Only the Flame Wake Phoenixes can really go over the top, fly over. Um, even something like a Gurmag Angler runs into Harbinger of the Tides. And that's a really, especially with Vile, that's a really powerful. And yeah, like just the Curse Catcher here taking down the Lightning Bolt, making sure that the Master's there. So this is what's going to happen. Chris is going to try to build a board. Uh, and then once that's done, it's very hard for Ben to go over the top. So Ruben now unable to contest that master of the Pearl Trident there. And we're going to see what the follow-up play is now. It is a Goblin Law. Yeah. JVL all over that card viewer. Selected the incorrect art, though. The, the, I don't... Oh, sorry, not the incorrect art, the incorrect version. I believe this is the correct no, version. No, 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 no. That, that flower... All about 10th edition. Oh, well. Here we go. Draw four, discard three. Let's see if Ruben can fix up that hand. Discard some of the clunkers he doesn't want anymore. And it's a foil goblin lore as well, Ben Ruben. A, pr a true man of taste and refinement. Let's have a look. Oh, no. 
Phoenix, <laughs> Lightning Bolt. Yeah, these are the cards you wanted to keep. Well, the Lightning Bolt for sure you didn't want to get rid of. Oh, dear. Okay, what do we got to follow it up here, Rubes? A, it looks like he has a Flame Wake Adept. If I'm Flame Blade Adept. Flame Blade ball. Adept in hand. Um, but yeah, ju just to mention again that how important Goblin Lore is to this deck, it adds a level of... This word's going to sound strange with the card Goblin Lord, but consistency oh, to yeah. the deck. Yeah. Because you're increasing uh, the number of chances of playing zero mana hollow ones. This is the thing with Goblin Lord. I mean, with, I mean, with Burning Inquiry, with, with whatever the cards that mean that uh, the hollow one player can just chuck their, chuck their hands away. Most of the deck doesn't care if it's in the graveyard or the, or the hand. Yes. A lot of the deck is is designed to be resilient and like to be played from either zone, right? We've got mm -hmm. Blood Gas, we've got Flame Wake Phoenixes, we've got we've got you know Faithless Looting, what have you. So when you talk about consistency in terms of a random effect, I know it sounds very weird, but I sure. think you're right. Like it means that you're just seeing more cards. Right, you're burning through more of your deck. Well, literally sometimes. Um, but yeah, and and the fact that the Phoenix synergizes with uh, Flame Blade Adept which you've boosted with a Burning Inquiry in your Goblin Lore, makes, increases that synergy. Um, oh, wow, that, was, that is a throwback. That book burning, one of the first cards when uh, I, I opened in a Magic Booster. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, wow, there we go. Sweet pick up there as we see now a Merfolk of the, Pearl, of the Pearl Trident getting in for three. Ruben down to 11 now. So Lord of Atlantis joining his fishy brethren here. And another foil Goblin Lore, Ben Ruben bringing the heat. Grandma Goblin says, come, come children, <laughs> sit, I will tell you, tell you the tale of our people. Right, and it's actually really relevant that Ben is getting Goblin Gores rather than Burning Inquiries. A, because he's not down a card by casting them, and B, because uh, the way Chris's hands are going to develop is he's going to develop his Merfolk through his Vials, and he, he missed his land drop. Mm -hmm. So eventually, Chris is going to play his most relevant frets and keep the least relevant ones in hand, so Burning Inquirer has a higher chance to improve your opponent's hand as the game goes on. So it's important that Goblin Lord is, is one-sided, essentially, here. Ben Rubin has discarded another Flame Wake Phoenix. Now, it actually can come back one more game here because he has discarded three cards, which buffs up the Flame Blade Adept. Another Flame Wake Phoenix in hand for Ruben. He hasn't had a great time discarding cards, but don't worry, Eduardo. Another Goblin Lore in hand for Big Rubes over there. <laughs> I, I've, well, I think we'll see that one, but I don't believe we'll see it this turn. I think this turn, uh, Ben is better served by getting back both Phoenixes. Ugh, since it's mountains. Continue. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. I, I understand. You understand. So certain things have to be taken Ugh. care of. Ugh. That, that is negative, uh, negative five. Oh, yeah. And I mean, he did <laughs> such good work with the foil goblin laws, but now Ben Rubin, mate, undoing wait, all wait, that Wait, wait. Those, oh, those are also uh, white-bordered lightning bolts. This is just... Oh, this is a mess. But yeah, as, as I was mentioning, <laughs> was saying, more excuse serious. me, sorry, let's get back on track here. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, we had to take care of important matters. Important business, that's it. Now, now, like, talking about the game, uh, basically, yeah, getting back the four power of haste, because, look, Ben is at nine, he need, he, and he can't win a long game. He has to put the pressure. So that means that he has to get back the Phoenixes in order to add that pressure. He knows that at nine life versus Merfolk, he's in real trouble, but he can't stay back. Blood Gas can't block. Uh, Phoenix has to get in. Um, which means that he essentially kind of has to go in with everything. Um, it might be that the Blood Gas just returned, so it, it wouldn't have been able to attack. No, no, he, he's not attacking into the 3-3 Lord of Atlantis here, and uh, even though it can't block, I mean, we're going to see now um, Beckmesian is going to just flood the board here. So many two drops yeah. in, the, in the Merfolk list. Yeah, the, okay, so because that decision's a little weird to me, uh, because the Blood Gas, um, it might be worth going just because Vile is a card. And... It's very easy for Chris to potentially um, double block the Adept with a Vile activation. You do, you lose your Lord. So I, I probably would have got in with a Blood Gas because I think it's a very low cost to get in there. Um, even though it seems like you're losing the card, I think you'll get it back eventually. Um, but I think this is kind of a, a minute point since it's pretty likely Chris is going to, to win. The second he gets another Lord in play, it's over. And already this is... Uh, Th this is pretty close to lethal if it's not... It's already lethal, right? Like, Ben's at 9, so wow, this is... Wow, now with yeah. the Regery, definitely beyond lethal here as we see yeah, big attacks here done. for Beckmesian, and that'll, that is going to do it here for Ben Rubin, who has to pack him up. Hollow one, the bone's not rolling in his favor this time around, Eduardo, here. And, I mean, this is what happens. Live by the sword, die by the sword. Live by the law, die by the law. And uh, that's what's happened here to Ben Rubin, who saw zero hollow ones. So it didn't really do anything particularly busted. He just kind of played some mediocre cards and it didn't come together. But 
as you mentioned, Goblin Law, Hollow One players, they can't complain about this. Right, exactly. Uh, at the same time, I think this matchup game one is awkward. If he doesn't get a Hollow One or, or a Hollow Two in play by turn one or two, then he's too far behind. Um, because he needs that board presence. You could see that Chris had that Harbinger of the Tides to bounce uh, the Flame Blade Adept, and that was more than enough to stop any pressure. But the fact that he had it, if Ben had kept the Gurmag Angler in hand, means that um, Chris w had the answer. But uh, going into the sideboard, uh, Ben is going to have access to a lot more interaction. He has one very spicy card in Vithian Stinger. Yeah, let's have a look at this card here. Vithian Stinger is... Uh I mean, geez, it's a it's a very, very interesting option here. Just as the one-off, just as the one-off for Ben Rubin there. I mean, you know, there's other stuff that's, that's obviously going to come in. Fatal Push is great against all the, the various Merfolk Lords and what have you. But, uh, I mean, the Stinger is uh, going to get some work done here, I would say. Um, it could. Um, it's okay when you're playing it on an Unlord board against a Silvergale Adept, a Phantasmal Image, a Curse Catcher. That's where it's good. It also breaks the Kira Great Glass Spinner Shield. Um, so it probably will go in, just because it, basically Chris is on a creature deck. But Ben is going to also sideboard in um, the free Fatal Push and the free Grim Lava Mancer. And that's for sure like the most important cards. He could also add in Collective Brutality, Big Game Hunter. Like They're kind of conditional. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're pretty weak. Um, but I think for me, what matters the most in these sports board games is that Ben gets access to free Fatal Push, free Grim Lava Mancer. And that on Chris's side, there's actually very little. He doesn't well, what, have, what's he working with here? Let's have a look. He's actually working very with very little. Um, the Chalice of the Void doesn't stop most of Ben's deck. It does stop the interaction, so it might be okay on the play on X equals 1, but it doesn't stop all the big creatures and the frets. Uh, so I'm not the biggest fan of it. And then Gutshot's not, not really useful. He's probably going to board in the two Relic of Progenitus and the Echoing Truth, since a lot of the frets that Ben is producing are conditional casts, right? Like... Uh, Hollow One is good with Goblin Lore or Burning Inquiry, but it's not going to be enough. Like, if you bounce and you don't have that card, it's just a cycle two yeah. draw card. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so I, I believe that Chris is going to stay very close to his main deck and will board in an Echoing Truth and two Relic of Progenitus. Um, because, I, again, I believe he's favored, so to stay favored, you kind of have to stay in the same configuration. I would, I would argue... And there uh, aren't a huge amount of slots in the Merfolk list that can are really up for grabs. I mean, you've yep. got to maintain that that critical mass of uh, of lords and uh, and value creatures, right? Right. And actually, looking at his list, it's kind of tough to see what he bought out. Since spreading seas are actually really good against Ben Rubin, since he he can operate on mana light situations and a lot of one mana colored spells. Um, so spreading seas is not the cut. So the the cut is from Chris is actually a little hard to see. It could be Kira, but I really like Kira in the post-board games even more so than the pre-board ones. Master of Waves is great. Um, the tokens being able to block the big frets, go over the top, having that protection from red. Um, the Vapor Snags are also okay, so we're probably going to see... If he was on the play, the, uh, the Curse Catchers might be close, but they are the only one drop. Phantasmal Image might come out. Um, it's one of the more conditional cards. It's very good, in a way, against the Hollow One deck. Um, because you can copy large 5.5s five and 4.4s four when the board is a bit empty. So um, I'm not sure what... Cr this is also why I don't see Chris boarding in much. There's not much he wants to lose. Maybe the Regeries are like the most conditional order. It's free mana. It's a bit expensive. So that would be like the card I would go to to cut. Um, but you can't go down too much, right? So I believe what we're going to see is Chris stay very close to his main deck and Ben Rubin side in those Fatal Pushes, that gr the Grim Lava Mancers. That Vidian Stinger, and maybe the Big Game Hunter, maybe the Collective Brutality. Um, ben Rubin does have access to Ancient Grudge against A for Vile, but I think that's barking up the wrong Yeah, thing. that's uh, particularly maybe a little bit of a narrow answer there. I like the Big Game Hunters, though. It, a, a weird uh, card on, on the face of it. Weird card to bring in against a deck that's full of 1-1s one and 2-2s, two but uh, more often than not, these cards end up with more than four power, and, and, and slamming this uh, big game hunter to play, especially via Madness, is huge if you can snipe one of the Lords, uh, you know, uh, right. off, off the back of one of these discard spells. Exactly. However, I believe that we're going to not see Ben Rubin board him in ultimately, because it's a non-condition. Uh, if big game hunter comes into play, it has to destroy something, and it's more likely that Ben will have a four power creature. Oh, yeah. on, on, honestly, I think if there's like two or three Lords, you're already losing, so it's better to rely on your lightning bolts and fatal pushes and great lava answers here. Well, let's see if Rubin is on that plan here as both players exo uh, examine their opening hands. Uh, were they going to be happy with what they've got? Can't see exactly what's going on in either player's hand here as they 
We'll whip those uh, cards around. Looks like Beck Mesian is happy enough. Looks like Ruben's happy enough. So we're off to the races with game number two here. Round number five of GP Toronto. The format is modern. You're watching the pro show with me, Riley Knight, and with him, Eduardo Sajgalic. It's great to have him along, of course, Eduardo, a modern master of the game. He's represented... Uh, well, half of planet Earth, really, at the World Magic <laughs> Cup. He was the English captain a couple of years ago, Canadian captain last year. I think you're the lined up for the captaincy of Antarctica for later on this year. So We, we have to wait until that becomes a thing. <laughs> it's a, Yeah, it's a tight race, I understand, for the Antarctic captaincy here. Right. Ruben opening up with the Grim Lava Mats. That's a nice one from him. Right, and you can see here both players that with their key cyborg cards. Relic is the card that Chris does want in this matchup um, because it interacts so well against a lot of what the Hollow End... Uh, hollow one deck does. It works against Grim Lava Mancer. Um, the way Ben wants to beat that card is force Chris into a position where his graveyard is large enough um, that a Delve creature is a potential threat to pop that relic and then continue from there. Um, ben is considering his turn. He does have access to Goblin Lore plus Hollow One, but I think he's going to go for the extremely safe Faithless Looting uh, and just play Hollow One for a No one to spin those wheels this time. No, no, no. No way, no how. So discard two cards here, and we're going to see Ruben continue to, well, have, have a much better start than, uh, than he did in the, in the uh, previous game there. Right. And here, because Ben got rid of two cards plus the Faithless looting, um, Chris will probably remove two cards. As long as Ben has a fetch line remaining, he can use that Grim Lava Mancer activation unless Chris decides to crack the Relic. But it's going to be... Th this at least uh, gives Ben a turn because Chris can't slam down a Lord. It's it's really risky to do so um, since you're relying on Ben only having one card, like not having a fetch land or any interaction spell. And I think that's asking for too much. Relic so exiles the Scalding Tarn now and Beckmazian follows it up with another Relic that's going to keep Ruben's graveyard nice and empty. So a slower start for Beckmazian and he is under a lot of pressure very early here, Eduardo. Right. 4-4, uh, four, four, turn 2, that's that's definitely getting there. Um, the thing is, depends on Chris's hand. I, I can see two lords. The card he really wants in this spot is um, Harbinger of the Tides. Uh, essentially buying him more time um, while exiling the graveyard, redrawing cards, redeveloping his board position. Um, essentially, he can keep the Grim Lava Mancer off um, between the two relics. So what Chris is trying to do is just... You know, by, try to avoid that Grim Lava Mancer being active and deploy, say, two Lords at once so that they're both free freeze. And you mentioned before how bounce spells of, of, of various types, whether it's a Harbinger of the Tides or something like a Vapor Snag, they're at a premium against the Hollow One decks because of the conditional nature of many of the, of the, of the cards that are cast. Bouncing a Hollow One, it becomes a 5-mana 4-4 four, four again. It's not free. And so that can do a lot of work uh, in matchups where, you know, Delve Creatures, for example, uh, harder to recast than bounce spells. Very, very good against them. Hollow, oh, sorry, a Goblin Law now for Ben Rubin. We'll see if he can continue to... Fire on all cylinders here, Eduardo, as three cards get discarded at random. Yeah, it, it is my belief, based on how this sequence has gone, uh, that uh, Chris is most likely going to sack that relic at end of turn uh, to remove whatever is in that graveyard. Well, nothing of too much particular note here. Double Street Wraith, Goblin Law, and a Tassiga, the King of the Bananas, has joined the graveyard here. And it doesn't look like uh, Ruby Rubes has anything else to add to the battlefield here. No. Yeah. Um, it's worth noting that Chris um, decided not to run this member in his deck, and that's going to cost him in this matchup particularly, mm. because he has no, apart from Gutshot, which is really bad in this matchup, except for specifically Grim Lava Mancer, uh, he has no answers to it, and not having the dismember means that a 4-4 or 5-5 might run away with the game, barring a Harbinger of the Tides, so not running even, uh, like the call, well, essentially colorless answer of this member uh, will cost him in this matchup, but yeah. Didn't come pre prepared for the Hollow One matchup, Eduardo. I, I would say in the past that was a totally fair argument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we talked about this two weeks ago, it's like, oh, what's your, what's your Hollow One matchup like? People would be like, uh, not, it's not <laughs> right at the top of my radar, but uh, yeah, maybe maybe these days it is something you need to consider. Miro Regery comes down here for Beckmesian, and it's back over to Ruben, who is once again on the front foot getting it done with his Hollow One, and I think he's got a Tassiger in hand as well. Well, yeah, T Tassiger, I believe, was discarded earlier, so it might be a Gurmag Angler. Uh, but essentially here, what Ben wants more than anything else is a Burning Inquiry or a Goblin Lore. And the rationale for wanting these cards is essentially the Relic. Um, it's very hard for Ben to put two cards that naturally into his graveyard, so he needs one of Faithless Looting. Um, 
Burning Inquiry or Goblin Lore. So he's wanting to basically overload the graveyard, force Beckmesian into activating that relic, and then, I mean, it, it's an uphill battle for there because Beckmesian, I mean, how many relics can he bring in here? Well, he has two. Th those are the two. <laughs> <laughs> he's already uh, already deployed both of them here. Right. Uh, there's the Faithless Living, which is perfect. Um, there was a Goblin Lore, though. But, like, basically, if Ben can use a Grim Lava Mancer to kill any creatures, he gets really far ahead. And he'll be able to do so this turn. He also seems to have a Fatal Push in hand. So if Chris draws a land, his most likely line is to play two Lords, and that's going to fall afoul of Fatal Push plus Grim Lava Mancer. Draw three, discard four. Once again, Goblin Lore. I cannot believe that we are talking about this card as being a constructed powerhouse, but that is what it is. We saw a huge reaction to this card over the weekend as people uh, finally woke up to the raw power of, uh, of Goblin Law. Oh, Hollow One discarded off. That's not what you want. That's not what you want. No. But it all the same, it, it does mean that, uh, as you mentioned there, Ruben has filled up the graveyard, and uh, that's, pretty cre that's pretty key here. Yeah. Um, it seems like he also has a Street Wraith. Um, he has a Gurmag Angler, so if Chris doesn't crack his Relic next turn, we're going to see a big fret. Or if Ben can draw another land. Because if Ben draws another land, he can go... Oh, actually, that's not... Uh, the line I was going to mention is not possible, because Grim Lava Mancer and the Delph Creature both require the same resource. Yeah. Um, I would argue here that Ben's best line is to just Grim Lava Mancer the Regery, swing in for four, keep the pressure, make sure that the Chris's board is empty. We're going to see that line exactly take place. Ruben may have thought about a Delve Creature coming down, but it looks like he's instead going to satisfy himself. Chipping in for four here after uh, knocking that Regery out of the water. Or... Oh deeper into the water, down to the briny deeps. It's difficult to say. Is it fish out of water or... Well, in this case, the fish, yeah, def definitely out of water. It, it, it kind of, from a flavor perspective, I guess it's the island of Ho Hawaii and there's like a volcano coming out underwater and boils the fish. Yeah, that's a good... Actually, I was going to say, it, it's actually very hard to, to thread that needle because obviously like fire fire type, not very good against water type. But uh, uh, yeah, you found you found the line. Yes. You found the line. It's we boiled the Merfolk... <laughs> the Regery. The <laughs> Regery got boiled, 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 boiled fish for dinner, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes, indeed. And uh, boil one of the cards that, of course, is so, so good against a deck like Merfolk. Choke another one. And that's why we see things like uh, Obora and Minamo ways to uh, protect those islands from uh, from these hateful effects there. Not often played, but when they are, whoo, whoo boy. Yeah, and and this is why, like, uh, Boyle and Choke specifically are not as great against Merfolk. The Vile, the, oh, the, the vile. Moboro, the Caverns, like, that, 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 that means that you're, that if you're not doing Armageddon, it's not worth having the card, really. And yeah, there we go. The, the line that was mentioned earlier, the one where you play two lords, and now Ben is going to untap, fatal push one, Grim Lava Mancer the other. And so this uh, is uh, all all but over here for Beckmesia now, as we see uh, Ruben with all the answers. The reason that the Grim Lava Mancer will, of course, be able to knock out the 3-3 three, three is that once fatal push gets rid of that master, the lord is going to go down to a 2-2, two, two, and that'll be just about all she wrote today, sports fans. Looks like Ruben is, oh, be still my beating heart. Is this a third goblin law? Uh, it is, but I believe Ben won't cast that. I believe Ben's line here is to go for collective brutality, look at Chris's hand in case there are si there's cyborg technology, and um, it's almost close to killing Chris this turn since it puts Chris at eight attack. Okay, no, this actually just straight up kills Chris. All right, straight up, uh, straight up end of the uh, end of the game here as we see now the removal of the Grim Lava. Oh, sorry, removal of the Lord means the Lava Mancer can go upstairs. The attack with the the Hollow One and the Bloodgast takes Beckmesian down to a cold zero there. So equalizing there, Ben Rubin, a much better start from him. And it has to be said, Beckmesian didn't do what his deck was supposed to do. There were no merfolk on the battlefield early. I mean, those relics are a nice uh, piece of anti-sideboard technology, but Rubin navigated those waters masterfully and uh, came up trumps. Exactly. and But like something to note here is how much worse relic is against Ben from a, a deck like merfolk. Uh, because usually Ben is going to shave Phoenixes and Bloodgasts against a deck like Chris's. You, you don't need as much graveyard interaction. Um, you essentially want to build a board presence and turn into a mid-range deck that can beat Merfolk through Fatal Pushes and Grim Lava Mancer. It looks and like he's taken out some number of Burning Inquiries there. Um, that's, that is another possibility. Now that like the cards you discard are relevant, say the Phoenixes and the Bloodgasts, um, well, th if you're shaving those numbers, then Burning Inquiry becomes a little worse. Essentially, because you're, the problem with Burning Inquiry is you're down a card. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, both players draw and discard free, but you are using the card itself, Burning Inquiry, so you're down a card. So you, in post-board games, it's probably correct to board out a number of them 
just because, especially when your graveyard is being attacked or your blood gas and, and phoenixes have less value because then the cards you discard become very relevant and that's a problem. Um, but yeah, you could see the power there of Grim Lava Menser. Oh yeah. One of the best answers in creature matchups. Any creature matchup, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it is at its best, even against a deck like Humans, that has tons of disruption on many levels, but it cannot deal with a creature very often. No, that's the thing. I mean, uh, often the, the Humans list were le lent pretty heavily on cards like Reflector Mage for that sort of thing. We've seen a, a, a shift away from that recently. And cards like Revive Amancer, given the lack of removal and the lack of hard interaction that, uh, that the Humans deck has as a repeatable removal spell, very, very, very good. Obviously, the Humans deck has ways to buff its creatures, Thalia's Lieutenant, what have you. But all the same, I mean, you know, just it's a, a, it's quite amazing how good repeated two damage is in modern right now, Edwarder. Yeah. So, yeah, the Grim Lava Mancer is like just a nightmare for these creature decks, like a total... Like, it, basically, if, if it even kills one creature, you just have to acknowledge that it's still there. Yeah. And that's the problem. It's not that it kills something, it's that it kills something and it's there, and it's going to kill more things unless you deal with it. Um, so, yeah. And, and basically, that's why Ben is a lot better post-board. He boards out a lot of these random discard effects. He boards out some of these slightly <laughs> weaker graveyards. boards out all the bad cards. <laughs> well, yeah, you improve your deck, right? Like... You're boarding out the cards that I barely played in a draft deck for That's what I'm saying. actual... No, 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 no. Not cards that are bad in the matchup. Just like actual, <laughs> literal bad cards. Just just it's bad. <laughs> just the bad cards taken out. So I accidentally registered these in my starting 60. Like <laughs> I can change at the end of every game. Jeez. Oh, well, the, well, there we go. Looks like these players putting their finishing touches on the starting 60s they're looking to present here. And we are going to go to a game three here for Ben Rubin and Chris Beckmesian. Actually, one interesting thing I saw while Chris was shuffling was Gutshot. He got so destroyed by that Grim Lava Mancer that he decided that he needed the help of Gutshot. And it really is only good against... It's very good against Grim Lava Mancer, but it's only good against mm. Grim Lava Mancer. So it, it's kind of this weird situation where if Ben plays Grim Lava Mancer and Chris has Gutshot, the Gutshot's great. Any other situation, the Gutshot is a horrible card because you're one card down on your Merfolk synergy, um, so it's a lot harder to assemble a, uh, a streak of lords. And you're also in a situation where, well, if you're one card down in a mid-range matchup, that's horrible. Being a card down in any mid-range matchup is a disaster. If your opponent is on a deck with Fatal Pushes and Lightning Bolts and your plan is to board in Gutshot, the problem is that, okay, it answers Grim Lava Mancer, but your plan is not at its best. So, yeah. And because you're, you're, yeah. you are taking away from that, uh, that critical mass. We talked about this before. Merfolk is a very linear strategy that requires a, a critical mass of key cards that all work towards the same kind of goal. And it, it, it's almost combo-like in the sense that if you take out too many of the main, deck, main game plan cards, then, yeah, you, you dilute your, your game plan in a major way. Right, so let's see the hand. Okay, that, that has may, brought in Gutshot, as you mentioned. Yeah, that may not be a keep, though, just because of one land. But if you had kept two, if it was two lands with Relic and Gutshot, you can kind of picture how, like, the Merfolk synergies are being hit pretty hard. I'm a little surprised by the Phantasmal image. It can be okay in the matchup, but post-board, you saw Ben keep in Collective Brutality. So for me, that would signal that Phantasmal image is a very high-risk card, and I would not want to run it because it dies to... Uh, fatal push without revolt. It dies to everything. So yeah. I'm, a, I'm not a big fan of a card like Phantasmal Image from Merfolk in this post-board matchup. Because um, it dies to actual, like, every removal spell ever, basically. Yeah. If it dies to Vidian Stinger and it's not, it doesn't cost one, it's probably a mistake. It dies <laughs> to pump spells. <laughs> That's got to be the best kill. Mutagenic yeah. growth. Mutagenic <laughs> growth. Your, uh, your phantasmal image. Yeah, we've all, we've all been there. Oh, my goodness me. Both players down to six here. Ben Rubin and Chris beck Mesian lining up on the Pro Show here from Grand Prix Toronto. And what a pleasure it is to have your company along with us on this beautiful snowy Saturday from Canada. Certainly great pleasure to have made the trip over the Atlantic. I know uh, you're, uh, you're based over here in, uh, over in uh, Montreal, I understand. Yes. Uh, so I live in Montreal, and uh, which is an amazing city for what it's worth. <laughs> And I'm delighted to be able to to come like to this GP in Can like the, the Grand Prix came here in Canada. Yeah, um, where I'm from in uh, where, where I live now in the province of Quebec, tons of modern fans. Oh yeah, and a you lot were came out. This, yeah. A lot came out in force here through the snow. It doesn't matter. Modern's at stake. You get here. Yeah, we got uh, we got fifty or fifty or sixty centimeters of snow in uh, some areas, and uh, players have turned up. They've they've stamped the snow from their boots and. Uh, 
and uh, brushed it from their shoulders and sat down to get it done here at GP Toronto. Great to have the Canadian contingent out in force. Many of the world's greatest players, of course, hailing from Canada. And uh, we've got quite a number of them here. John Stern, Pascal Maynard, some of the other big names as well. I'm sure we'll check in with them as the day continues here. Yeah, Alexander Heen as well. Alexander Heen, yes. yes, and in contention for the captaincy of Canada, along with Pascal Maynard, the Lord of the Snow-Covered Plains, <laughs> I believe is the, the unofficial title of the Canadian captain. Beck Meezy down to five now. That's not one you want to see. He's going to have a rough time here. Looks like Ruben is happy enough with the grip that he's got here. But talk to us a little bit about the Magic community here in Canada. Sure. I know you've represented the uh, the nation at the World Magic Cup at some of the highest levels of competition, Eduardo. And mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that, yeah, your home city is, is, a, is a stronghold of modern. Right. So um, essentially uh, in Quebec, um, when it's time for the mo modern PPTQs get a ridiculous attendance. On Even like tiny shops in the middle of nowhere get 30 to 40 people. Is that right? Yes. They're very competitive. Other formats, not as much. Um, it's much more based on locale and shop and uh, the competitiveness of the area. But yeah, for sure, like Quebec is a strong, like they love modern. Big, big fans over there. Um, and there's actually, um, actually, there's an open next weekend. Oh, really? In Montreal, yeah. Oh, wow. There we go. For so modern again. Bit, a bit of practice this weekend here and uh, seeking fame and fortune. And the modern train continues. Of course, it will for you as well. Revered viewers around the world will be heading back over the Atlantic to GP Lyon. I'll be there with the rest of the European coverage team to bring you live action from France. I can't wait to do it, my friends. It's been a triple modern weekends I've had for the last couple of weeks. I, I can't wait for it to continue here. Bit Mesian down to four now, Eduardo. Yeah, and with a critical mass deck, that, that's pretty Ooh. much the end of it, I believe. As long as Ben doesn't have a... I believe Ben has a Grim Lava Mancer already, so that, that puts him already far ahead, let alone Chris going down to four. So if we had the old Pro Tour Advantage bar at all, it'd be, it'd be slammed over, all the way over the left, as would the Luck Bar. <laughs> the Luck Bar? The Luck Bar, yeah, we're looking at bringing that in for Pro Tour, for the Pro Tours in the future. Is that, is that the Pro Tours that would involve a Burning Inquiry? Oh yeah, then the Luck Bar just goes haywire in situations like that. Beckmesian keeping this four, but I tell you what, rough stuff for him. Ruben now to six, but a mulligan to four. I mean, we don't often see players win from it. However, here's the one drop, Curse Catcher off an island. What can Ruben do in response here? Uh, land Curse Catcher. Uh, sorry, land uh, Grim Lava Mancer. Yeah, a little bit of a better play. I, I, I like that line a little better from Ruben here. Yeah, and, and there's not much that Chris can do to punish Ben, unless he top decks that gut shot. Oh, yeah. yeah. Finds the way forward. But, but, I mean, even then, like, Ben has Lightning Bolt, Collective Brutality. This is really... I mean, Ben's hand is already so strong for this matchup. And on top of it, Chris is down to four cards. He's not even yeah. going to have a second land drop. This is carnage. This is very unfortunate here as Double Curse Catcher now enters the fray. But Ruben has the goods in the form of Grim Lava Mancer. And plenty of lands, a lot of spells there to deploy. And uh, there's going to be a bit of a walk in the park here for Ruben, who looks pretty comfortably set to move to 5-0. and Yeah, I think here, like, just basically Ben chooses a Lightning Wolt on this Curse Catcher, kills the other, then Chris is in terrible shape, and yeah. Actually, that was a kind of a strange... I guess he has a Street Rave, so it's okay. Um, it's kind of strange to play the Fast Land rather than the, a Fetch Land here. Um, but yeah, like as long as there's a street wraith and a lightning bolt keep being that, played, probably safe. Keep that board nice and clear here. Oh no, we're going to go for a faithless looting by the look of things. So obviously Ruben not too worried about the board presence at the moment. He knows he's got it locked up eventually. So he's just going to uh, take his time to consolidate his draws, sculpt that out, sculpt out that perfect hand and cruise on to victory. Now, Beckmesian did have to make some pretty unfortunate mulligans. Let's let's head back to what he his the decisions he made, you know, when he was on 6 and 7. Did you agree with with going down to 6 and then and then the decision to go down to 5 as well? Later well, after that? well, going to 6 for sure. There was just a one lander. That that was an easy one. Um, the 6 card hand was one that um, I only spotted some glimpses of, but maybe should have been a keep. It involved, I believe, two Muta Vaults and a Blue Source and two Lords. So maybe Chris was worried that it wouldn't be strong enough, but I'm pretty sure I saw that hand wrong because I believe that hand would have been more than strong enough to get the job done. Much closer decision in any case, and uh, Beckmesian punished for it, however. I can't fault him too much for having made this decision after, yeah, pretty rough stuff on seven and on five here. Back to Ruben now. <laughs> Beckmesian passes the turn five or six times. And Rubes does have the goods here with Lightning Bolt, with Fetch Lands, all sorts of business, all day, every day here. Uh, this Hollow One deck, not living up to its name. Yeah, it doesn't need to here, no. though. Should be called Grim Lava Mancer. 
Black, red, gl grim, lava, mansa. That's good enough here. That's what it's all about. Uh, by the way, a, min a little minor thing that happened here that is pretty critical is that Ben, before doing anything else, uh, played a fetch land. And the reason that's relevant is that if he had done any other spell, Chris could have responded uh, with the Relic of Progenitus being sacked to avoid uh, potential Grim Lava Mancer activation. So by, by playing the fetch land, like, there's nothing that Chris can really do. Because that land is already in the graveyard before Bekmazian has a chance to respond, which means that Lava Mancer can uh, snap off its ability at a moment's notice. Flame Blade Adept comes down and another Grim Lava Mancer. Oh no, Bekmazian, my friend. The beatings continue here. Indeed, but it's interesting that Grim Lava Mancer is just one of those cards that is really bad in multiples most of the time, unless you manage to stock your graveyard incredibly well. But this this is just that gut shot insurance, right? It means that Bekmazian can't draw live to, uh, for an answer to, to the situation he's in. Yeah. So Relic of Progenitus, we're going to see an activation of Grim Lava Mancer in response here. Bekmazian checking this card. Having read, oh, wow. It's really good against me. It's, <laughs> this card's, wow. It's a good choice, buddy. You've, you've really crushed me with it. Yeah. If I had to hazard the actual reason he did check the text, it's because removing the cards is part of the cost. Uh, so he can't, like, respond. And, and um, there, there was a card where that was the case, Death Right Shaman, uh -huh. which yeah. is thankfully uh, in the Hall of Infamy. Yeah, this point. <laughs> the Hall of Infamy is a great way to put it. Banned in modern. And, of course, uh, uh, an all-star in Legacy. A little one mana pseudo planeswalker really so one mana planeswalker that dies to fatal push i, I guess yeah it, it, yeah that card is ludicrous <laughs> on many levels lightning bolt and now an attack oh look at this big attack big attack for three taste it beck out of 17 now yeah um this is actually an interesting spot because uh okay so so chris is in a horrible spot <laughs> let's, <laughs> okay. let's get that so out it's an it. interesting spot but let's not get it let's not deflect any attention for the fact that it's horrible okay continue right um, the core here, though, is that Ben is not putting that fast of a clock. So be because the clock's not that fast, if Chris had a way to go over the top of these Lava Mancers, then he would have a shot at winning um, the game. I, I believe he even drew the Master Ways, which is that way. However, because Ben Rubin has access to Collective Brutality, that's an easy, clean kill. So I think for Chris to win, he has to next turn draw... Kira Grey Glass Spinner. Okay. Uh, protecting basically against these Grim Lava Mancers. And then he has to play Master of Waves. And then he has a very protected full board and has chance. One mana. It's going to be an Aether Vial. That is not, uh, not what the doctor ordered here. Dr. Eduardo's prognosis was ignored by Chris Beckmazian here. Yes, I, I, uh, my, my prognosis was to. My uh, prescription was you need to get much luckier than this. Yeah, and uh, he failed to do that. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, uh, this rubbing and drubbing continues here from Ben Rubin, who I think activated the secret mode of Bloodgast, casting it for two black mana. The, wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> it's got a hidden mode on it. It's very, very difficult to spot, but uh, there is another way of putting a Bloodgast on the battlefield, and it involves tapping lands and or tapping mana sources. Yeah. And uh, casting it from your hand doesn't often happen, but we have seen it here. Yeah, I used to see that a lot more when the card was standard legal. Mm -hmm. Those are Vampire's deck that would often... It was playing Bloodgast the way it was intended. No. Oh. Not Actually, the way. wait, no, wait. Not the way no, it was intended. Not the way it was the intended. The way it's intended is that you put in your graveyard for free. Yeah. Yeah, the Vapor so. Snag here. Um, it's, a, it's a good card against the Delve Creatures and all one. Against Flame Blade Adapt, a little less so, though. Yeah, bouncing that 1-2 uh, is not doing a huge amount of damage. And no follow-up play here for Beckmazian. The top of his library not treating him kindly all the way from that mulligan down to 4. His library has just not been cooperating at all. And Ruben has played it very slow. This is something that we need to talk about, uh, Eduardo. The role that you take when you're ahead in a game of Magic. When you're behind, you want to take risks. You need to sort of push those chips into the center of the table and make the plays that, that give you a chance of getting back in. Yes. When you're ahead, it's very different. You can afford to play conservatively. Right. And, um, I mean, even if uh, we were more at parity on resources, Ben's hand, the way it was sculpted, encouraged... Uh, him to play that slower role, right? Like Grim Lava Mancer, Lightning Bolt. These are cards that just want you to prolong the game, um, especially the second one. Um, oh, wow. We're going to maybe see uh, Grim Lava Mancer taken down by the secret mode of Curse Catcher. Oh, as a one? Wow, it's not just a, it's not just a counter spell. Are we going to see here a... Uh a curse catcher block. Yes, the oh, oh no, only only I've only got one Grim Lava Mancer left. Says Ben Rubin. 
Indeed. Um, but yeah, Chris actually drew the Master of Waves. Uh, it's just that he forgot to draw the Kira. Ah, okay. Unfortunate. Yes. Unfortunate here. Bekmezian um, is now faced down by the, the uh, second coming of the Flame Blade Adept. Yeah. But to go back on your point of playing conservatively when you are ahead, mm -hmm. um, one thing that Ben didn't do this turn is play Goblin Lord. He's going to use the Goblin Lord next turn in order to essentially uh, deal lethal damage. Uh, by discarding free cards, pumping the Flame Blade Adept, and locking the game down with Blood Gas, Flame Blade Adept, and a Grim Lava Mancer activation. Grim Lava Mancer is certainly a great piece of technology in this matchup, and I've just seen a great piece of technology from someone who walked past wearing a hoodie with a with a pen tied in to one of the strings that go went around the side of the hoodie. He, this guy, is never losing his pen. I don't know where he's gone now, but I tell you what, what a what a what a powerful wizard indeed. I, I tend to lose my pen because I lend it to people, but that's... Well, he's never doing that. He's like <laughs> at the bank where he's got them on a string. He's going to say, yeah, you can use it, but it's not going anywhere, buddy. That's pretty good. But yeah, here the gut shot master of Waves Hand is... Uh, if, if Chris had been a, like an extra card or two, he might have had a shot here. The master of Waves does die to collective brutality, but um, yeah, th this is just over. I mean, it was over when we started the Grim Lava Mancers and... Now Ben Rubin doing Goblin Lore, which is going to be more than enough damage since Chris could technically kill the Grim Lava Mancer, but it doesn't matter. The Flame Blade Adept, 4 power, Blood Gas 2. Uh, yeah. Chris has no nothing to do with the blocks. Ben is just going to attack and that'll be it. This I mean, there's an Aether Vial on 2. Anything could happen. Except that we know the contents of his hand and yeah, there's and, the, and, nothing. And Ben is attacking about 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah, there's no uh, accidental... There's not, not going to be a cat that walks across his keyboard and hits F6 here. There's no discard, there's no make an action at random. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, no clock nappers here for Ben Be Beckmazian to steal the combat step, unfortunately for Ben Rubin. So, one, two attacks here for Beckmazian. He has a look at his hand, Master of Waves, gut shot amongst them. Gonna gut shot himself by the look of things and the extension of the hand. Beckmazian going out in style. Commiserations to Chris Beckmazian after having a very rough time with the Mulligans, but Ben Rubin managing to get up and about into round number six. Undefeated. Congratulations to him. That is that for our first feature match. More action coming your way from GP Toronto, so don't go anywhere. We've got to go to a break, but on the other side of this, Eduardo and myself will be here once more for more stuff from GP uh, Toronto. We'll see you back here very, very soon.
Welcome back here to the tournament floor at GP Toronto. It's a great pleasure to have you along. Welcome to our coverage if you've just joined us. And if you've been along for the whole ride, thanks so much for sticking with us. My name's Riley. I'm joined by Eduardo Sajgalic, Captain Canada, as he was at the WMC last year. Of course, you guys had a... Uh, well, look, we don't need to revisit that. Right now, we can... <laughs> We can get stuck in with continued coverage of the event. We're going to get stuck into some time walk magic now, my friends. We can have a look at what went on between Jonathan Rosen and Samuel Pardee. We've got Jeskai Control facing off against White Blue Control. And, uh, well, we enjoyed uh, watching this uh, pseudo mirror at the Pro Tour between Rafael Levy and uh, Paula Vida Dama de Rosa. This one's going to be a long one. Yeah, I, I hope it's not quite that long. The one game match. Oh yeah, yeah. The <laughs> the the fifty minute game one that we ultimately saw the French Hall of Famer get up and about. Poor old Pablo Doritos was uh, out spreading seized, and there was a lethal um, ancestral vision used by Levy to burn him out from the right. top of his library. But right now, things getting off to a bit of a slower start here with Rosam and Pardi. An early serum visions here for the Jeskai player. And Pardee is going to kick things off himself with a spreading seat. Right. So th this this match is going to take a while. So we're going to like I'm probably going to let some of the early actions slip by. But to, to kind of explain and set the stage here, mm -hmm. um, Jonathan is on a control version of Death Sky, four Cryptic Command, four Snapcaster Mage, Torrential Gear Hulk. Yeah. So he, Jonathan essentially is looking to play the long instant speed game while Sam Pardee is closer to the tap-out control. Field of Ruin, Spreading Seas, Planeswalkers. Um, the, the way you can kind of see which one is doing well, um, for me, Jonathan has the edge because he can act at instant speed, and a lot of Sam Pardee's threats being sorcery speed means that he can't fight Connor Wars as effectively as Jonathan can, and Jonathan goes ahead on a card thanks to cards like um, Cryptic Command and Snapcaster Mage. So, so it is my feeling that Sam is a little behind, especially because Spreading Seas doesn't stop the cards that matter. So Gideon of the Trials comes down. Party just jams it into play. And uh, obviously, Rosam either doesn't worry too much about it or doesn't have the answer. Goes up to four, then back down to two, thanks to Electrolyze. And Rosam will be happy to have uh, snapped off a burn spell for at least a little bit of value here. Right. The, the burn spells in Jonathan's deck are some of his worst cards, so if he can use them to take down a Planeswalker, that's, that's basically where you want to be. It's very difficult for the Jeskai control decks to burn out an opponent like white-blue control. Often, uh, Snap, Bolt, Snap, uh, Bolt, Snap, Bolt will get you there, uh, especially against like, decks like Grixis Shadow. But when, you're, when your opponent is playing a very easy and painless mana base, when they're not hurting themselves with fetches and shocks, and when they've got ways to buffer their life total with Sinker's Revelation, the burn plan becomes a lot worse. Indeed. And what also makes it worse is Sam is going to be overloaded on removal. He's going to have Supreme Verdicts that have no other modes, so don't be shocked if you see Supreme Verdict kill Snapcaster Mage. Yeah, yeah, the old, the old, <laughs> the old four mana Terminate. It's all, it can't be countered. Yeah, that's true. It's not so bad, but yeah. Um, so basically, Sam's route to victory is mostly going to be tap out, feel the ruin, spreading seas, try to get rid of as many of Jonathan's lands as possible. And what is going to happen here, uh, the longer the game goes on, the more we're going to see uh, is the blue-white control deck pulling further ahead on basic lands. This is key. Jonathan Rosam is playing four basics. Four basics in his entire deck, whereas Samuel Pardee is playing, well, you would presume between the usual eight, uh, seven, eight, or nine here, with uh, he's playing eight. So this means that uh, all of a sudden, Pardee is in a much better position to start gaining value out of a card like Field of Ruin. Exactly. So it, for, for what it's worth, I think Sam is playing uh, very close to uh, Alex Magelton's Pro Tour list, mm -hmm. at least in the main deck. Um, it might be the sideboards are a little different. I'd have to recheck, but he's decided to switch from his uh, Yul Fateful Eldrazi Tron. Uh, yeah. Change it up here. This deck has risen and risen on people's radars in modern. It's done better and better work as we've seen the format continue to develop. And it's, I mean, to the great, to the joy of many, Celestial Colonnade is uh, a playable card in modern once again. White Blue fell off the radar, Eduardo. It did. And not just white blue, every single Celestial So that's what I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. White blue based decks just uh, completely collapsed there for a while. What happened? The, the, the issue was that it was very hard to answer one for one when your opponents were casting multiple spells, instant speed collected companies um, could disrupt you very easily with a thought sees forcing you into action and Stubborn Denial is also a really strong card from yeah. the Death Shadow deck. So um, white blue specifically came about because of Field of Ruin. 
the printing of that card in Ixalan meant that those decks now had a real plan, a real mana denial plan, and gave them enough positive matchups that the decks could start existing. There are so many juicy, juicy targets for those Fields of Ruin. I mean, we've seen White Blue Control in the past. It did play, obviously, Ghost Quarters. Some of them played Tech Edges as well. But uh, Field of Ruin, critically, as we mentioned before, Eduardo, the difference is it means that the blue-white control player doesn't have to uh, stifle their own mana development to disrupt the opponents. Exactly. That point is critical. The fact that you get to basically re-get the, la the land again while your opponent may not puts you really far ahead and makes you much more interested in the card. Um, it's also worth pointing out, I noticed that I believe Jonathan had... Uh, that, that second basic island, I believe, was one that Jonathan had. If he draws the other basic, that's a total disaster. Um, essentially, when you're playing uh, control mirrors like this and one of the decks involved is white-blue control, getting a basic from any fetch line is an extreme mistake because you need as many basics as you can in your deck. In your library, that's right. Yeah, as we see another Serum Visions here from Jonathan Rosen. Oh, that was a disaster. He actually drew the island. Oh, no. Did he actually? So that's all four. Yeah, so now if Sam plays Field of Ruin, it's straight up one-sided strip mine. It's like a strip mine with, well, well a, a, a wasteland, wasteland that would costs be more accurate, two, yes, but yes. still replaces itself. And, and that's just huge here for Party because that means it's really going to be Party time as he continues to uh, hit his land drops. He's got a nice full grip. And, uh, I mean, this is very, it's a very slow matchup. No one's trying to get around that. As we see a Spreading Seas continue to play that Mana Denial plan. And this is really interesting to me. This is really interesting that we now have a blue-white control deck that is based around a plan of attrition playing against people's... I mean, this is, this is a Stone Rain type of deck, right? Yeah, to some degree, that is accurate. It uses the fact that modern basi uh, mana bases use some basics. So most decks have one to four basics, depending on which ones they are. But they don't go further because you need utility lands, you need lands that you can fetch, and you need the fetch lands. So, so many mana bases cannot afford to run this many basics. So that's what it does. It just buys time until it starts running you out of, la of lands, and then it uses that mana advantage um, to its edge. Um, and, and the reason I still give Jeskai the edge, maybe not in this game specifically, but in the matchup, is that it, while the deck does strive towards a mana advantage, for Cryptic Command and with four Snapcaster as backup is a really hard uh, situation for the control deck, like the tap out control deck to beat, though. And this is, this is a, uh, in my view, a weakness of the white blue control list is that it is so much more tap out. It's not, it's not the game that, you know, traditional control decks want to play. They want to play a draw go type game. And here we have a lot of enchantments. It's not only spreading seas, it's stuff like Search for Azcanter, it's Detention Sphere. In addition to that, lots of planeswalkers, things like Gideon of the Trials, Gideon Dura, Jace Architect of Thought. These are the guys that are now uh, forming the, the backbone of the, of the white blue control. Control list. Yes. Um, one, one way you can kind of see if Sam is ahead is if he resolves search for Escanta. Well, Jonathan's search is always going to be a little weaker uh, because Sam has access to four spreading seeds for Field of Ruin, but Jonathan only has one answer to Sam's uh, Escanta Sunken Ruin, one Field of Ruin. So, wow, that Nahiri resolving is a boon to Jonathan. So Jonathan Rosen only needs to get that Nahiri up, of course, to, uh, to eight. So she goes off very, very quickly, this ultimate, and that, that is going to mean a, a Torrential Gearhulk can come in from the, uh, uh, from the deck, but nothing in the way of uh, any, you know, Emrakul shenanigans here for Ro Jonathan Rosen. Yeah, and um, because there's no Emrakul shenanigans, as you mentioned, uh, I'm actually not going to be shocked if Jonathan decides to try to keep the Nahiri up a little higher. Um, essentially, not wanting the Nahiri to go away just for Torrential Cure Hulk, but keeping it around, getting rid of enchantments like Ruined Halo, mm -hmm. uh, Search for Escanta, cards that Sam may play, because that's really the, the key role Nahiri has here, is essentially um, dealing like with these situations. Well... Celestial Kalanad is going to contest Nahiri, but it is the classic <laughs> control mirror play. Path to Exile, your Celestial Kalanad. That is how it goes here. And Party, of course, plenty of basics for him to fetch out. He won't be too disappointed about that. He'll have known that that was almost certainly going to happen. Yeah, I mean, you're going to be, both players are going to be stuck in hand with cards that do nothing. Um, Jonathan is kind of fortunate that he only drew one Lightning Bolt out of his six Bolt slash Helix, um, because those cards are really bad in the matchup. Um, and uh, one of the ways uh, a white-blue control that gets ahead, because remember, they need a lot of land. So they need to have card advantage in some form to make up uh, for that with their opponent. And one way they do it is by uh, overloading your opponent with tons of dead cards. And Jonathan doesn't have that many dead cards. 
So that's why he's pulling so far ahead. Um, actually, yeah, like you can see that now here he can also improve the draws. It's basically the fact that it can loot or rummage rather makes it really powerful in that sense. Snapcaster Mage now coming down to looks like flashback that uh, <clears throat> path to exile, but Pardi with the uh, one of spell snare there to stop Tiago Chan in his tracks. We'll see if Rosam has a response here. Right. Looks like Party is all in on the Celestial Colonnade uh, plan to uh, attempt to contest that Nahiri. Yeah, and this is going to be an interesting situation. Uh, Sam doesn't have that much backup. He ha can Logic Knot or Negate. Um, or simply, uh, depending on the timing, like uh, Snapcast or Spell Snare again. Uh, but yeah, Jonathan's going to fire off one of his Cryptics. This is an okay spot to do so. So, counter draw here for Jonathan Rosen, the dismiss mode for uh, Cryptic Command. I would say the most commonly used mode, certainly, but that card just does everything. Just yeah. does everything. Yeah, for sure in this matchup, it's dismiss. Um, there's, there's very few situations where you want to bounce something uh, or any other mode, but yeah, the fact that that card in a lot of matchups can just destroy your opponent's board, um, it was incredible, especially in aggressive decks that could run it. Mm. Um, because you could Yes, because you could tap down your opponent's board and then attack for lethal. Essentially fly in the air, tap your opponent's board, yeah. fly in the air. And, that and was we really see nice. this these days with, with the Geist of St. Traff decks as well, yes. uh, to, to a lesser extent, so sure. Yeah, so here, Rune Halo, a non-issue because Nahiri can very easily get rid of that. Just chomp away. Yeah. It, it at least means that Jonathan can't rummage. And, and the other thing that, however, one thing that Sam has going for him is that Jonathan is very low on cards, but he drew a really important one in Secure the Waste, and he has Search for Escanta. And he's keep look at that <laughs> lightning helix tucked away at the bottom of his library just where he wants it. Those aren't the cards that he's looking to uh, to draw just yet here. So torrential gear hulk. Oh, are we are we flashing back uh, an electrolyze? Yeah, just to draw a card. Yeah, so you could he could have used I guess the cryptic to draw a card, but it makes more sense here to just deal a little more damage. Big attacks now for Rosam as he gets in for eight. Oh, sorry for seven. Excuse me. Yeah. By the way, it also keeps the cryptic command in the graveyard where it belongs for a snapcaster mage in the future. Party. Looks like he named uh, Celestial Colonnade with the ruined Halo. Search for Azkanda coming down for Rosam, who is pulling further and further ahead. The Gear Hulk back in the hand. You'd think that'd be a liability, that part of the activation of, uh, of Nahiri's ultimate. But uh, I think if Rosam wants the, the Gear Hulk anywhere right now, it's in his hand. Yeah, that, that's exactly where he wanted. Torrential Gear Hulk and Nahiri are a great combo. Um, yeah, essentially here, um, we, are, we are looking for... So Sam is going to be in a tough spot here between that gear hawk, the Snapcaster dealing some pressure, the search for Scanta being another source of pressure. But what Sam has go Samuel has going for him is, I have a lot of cards. So Jonathan's a little low on cards. They are all high impact, um, but Sam has a lot of them. So it just depends on um, what they actually are precisely. I see a Logic Nod, which is very relevant, but the way you can tell how good well this matchup is going pre-board is whoever has the most blue cards tends to win the pre-board match. Um, it's just a feature. The cards you care about are almost exclusively the blue ones in pre-board games. Party not looking to tussle over that Jace Architect of Thought, so Rosam does get to resolve his Cryptic Command. He's keeping himself further and further ahead here. Looks like uh, this search for Azkanda was successful, and we found the Sunken Ruin here. Yeah, the, 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 the quest was kind of done by the time, you know. You, oh, yeah. You search for Azkanda, but you're actually already waiting in the <laughs> You <pool>. know exactly <laughs> where it is. You've got a map. You've got, you know, you got GPS. Google Maps is there. <laughs> yeah. Siri's reading you step-by-step -step direction. So, yeah. you, you know your way. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Um, and now, because, interestingly, Sam doesn't have Spreading Seas or Field of Ruin for that search for that Azkanda, the Sunken Ruin. So, we're going to see Jonathan put extremely far ahead. Yeah. Torrential Gear Hulk, Negate, the Negate off the top as well. Yeah, I this mean, is that, is, that is that. And that is a very, very uh, sensible concession there from Samuel Pardee, who has to win two on the trot here in order to get uh, across the line. So that is how it went for game number one. And unfortunately for Samuel Pardee, uh, we are actually going to have to end this uh, nice and quick. And unfortunately for Pardee, he does go down as well in the match. So Jonathan Rosen gets up and continues his undefeated onslaught here. That is that for round number five, my friends. Thanks for your company so far. More action coming your way from GP Toronto. We've got to go to a break. But after this, JVL, TBS, and the show goes on. We'll see you back here very soon.